حتى إذا فتحت يأجوج ومأجوج وهم من كل حدب ينسلون الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين As always we begin by praising Allah Azza wa Jal and by asking Allah Azza wa Jal to exalt the mention and grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to his family and his companions. The topic for tonight's lecture is a very interesting one and a one that has become it's always been very relevant, but it's particularly come into people or to people's attention very recently. The title which we've been given for the lecture this evening is the Mahdi and the Messiah. And we know that the Messiah, the proper word for that in Arabic is Al-Masih. And of course, since there are two, there is a true Masih and there is a Masihun Dajjal, a false one. This becomes even more important to understand the reality of the situation. And right from the beginning, we're going to mention that the reason that there's been so much interest around this, and there always has, there's always been people on YouTube, there's always been people who have uh, all kinds of different theories about this and have different <laughs> ideas about it. But it really hit the mainstream because sadly, Netflix released a series called The Messiah. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I didn't actually waste my time watching it. I think it's not right for me to come to the masjid and to talk to you about Netflix, right? That's not the, that's not the purpose of the sitting tonight. At the same time, it wouldn't be right to be ignorant of that because that might be a cause for a lot of confusion and a lot of doubt among young people who might have watched it or have heard their friends who've watched it. So I thought I would take a middle path. And the middle path is that I researched it. I didn't watch it, but I went through synopses, people who wrote about it. I went through quotes from it. I went through some of the script and what happened. And I spoke to someone who watched it and I tried to get an idea of the kind of things that are being propagated in it. At the same time, I don't just want to make that lecture about this because ultimately if the only thing that you come away with tonight is that Netflix doesn't know anything about anything, that's not really a benefit for you because you knew that before you came. And if you're taking your deen from Netflix, that's a, that's a big musibah right there. That's a big problem if we're taking our religion from Netflix. So... Ultimately, that's not the purpose to talk about. But while telling the story, I do want to point out some things that are portrayed in that, which might be reasons for people to be confused or things people might be confused about. And also, not only that, but there are plenty of people who've been making videos on this topic before and confusing people and making people very, very confused. The reality is what we're going to talk about is an event which is going to happen in the future. And things which are going to happen in the future are part, ultimately part of the ghaib. The reality is none of us have knowledge of what is going to happen except from one source. And that is from Al-Wahi, from Revelation. We can't get knowledge of the, what is going to happen from any other source or any other place except from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa That's what's really going to tell us the reality of the Mahdi and the Messiah, the Masih. And it's a really important story and a really interesting story as well. It's not just important, it's very interesting and very, very relevant as we said. Ultimately, when you hear the Prophet Sallallahu describe the time in which the Dajjal will come, there's nobody who could listen to that and say, we're not living in that time. When you hear the signs, the minor signs of the Day of Judgment, and we don't really have time today to go through the minor signs that lead up to the Dajjal, because the Dajjal is basically the first of the major signs, of the 10 major signs. 
But prior to that, there are minor signs. Almost every single one of them, if not every single one, have already happened. Someone might say to me, but there are signs I know of which haven't happened. We say, if those signs exist, some of the scholars say they will happen after the Dajjal because some of them said not every minor sign will happen before the Dajjal. Some of the minor signs will happen afterwards. So basically everything that we know to be before the Dajjal has already happened. The only thing that we hold on to, and it's not a nice message and it's not a happy message, is that it might get worse before that happens. And the reason for that is that many of the minor signs, a classification or a category of the minor signs, are signs which happen but get worse. And for example, if we were to take the sign of people being bad to their parents and cutting off family ties, has this happened or not? No doubt, I think everybody agrees that we are in a time where, generally speaking, people of all in every society, we've seen people, generally speaking, are not treating their parents the way that they used to do that. And the family ties are not being kept the way they used to be kept. However, has it reached the point of, of its maximum severity? Probably not. And Allah knows best, it seems to be getting worse. That is the only thing that stands between you and between the Dajjal is just for these minor signs to get progressively worse because really there isn't anything else left. And the fact is that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum feared that the Dajjal would appear in their time. And you guys might have heard of what happened with Nusayyad and what they said about him and how they thought that he might have been the Dajjal. The fact is that the Sahaba was so certain or sure that the Dajjal would appear in their time. That's how much the Prophet ﷺ told them and how much they felt that they were, or how, he, how much he told them so much that they felt it was that close. <coughs> no doubt we are gonna talk about things that are going to happen prior to the Dajjal and a lot of people, a lot of videos. And this is not something really that the this particular series highlighted, but it's something that a lot of other videos highlight is the system that supports the Dajjal. And I think that before we talk about the Dajjal and before we talk about the Messiah, the Masih, and we talk about the Mahdi, it is worth talking about what people say about the system. The reality is that we as Muslims, we have to be balanced. Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And we have to verify information before it co comes to us. Allah Azza wa Jal said, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَئٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا أَن تُصِيبُوا قَوْمًا بِجَهَالَةٍ فَتُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala, He said to us, Oh, you who believe, when there comes to you a disobedient person with news, make sure of it so that you don't harm a people out of ignorance and then become regretful over what you have done. The thing that I'm concerned about is that when people talk about the system that will support the Dajjal and the things that will come before the Dajjal, two things happen. Number one, you hear people speaking in a very extreme way, like going to extremes and ghulu and making exaggeration about things. مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ They don't have any authority or knowledge from Allah to speak about that. They don't have a hadith, they don't have an evidence, they don't have a fiqh ruling, they don't have a fatwa, they don't have anything. They just have a YouTube channel and too much time on their hands. And so they start telling you about things that are coming before the Dajjal and how this is supporting the Dajjal and that is supporting the Dajjal. And they go to extremes and they speak about Allah and about Islam without knowledge. That's one problem. The other problem with that is it leads people, and this is the biggest fear you have. Even when someone told me that Netflix were releasing a series on the Messiah, the thing that made me the most fear out of everything is that people end up getting so caught up in this information that they actually lose the reality of what the Masih Dajjal is really going to be like. 
So they don't recognize him. And they don't recognize Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam, the Masih, the real Masih, Isa. And they don't recognize the Mahdi. So anyone who comes up and pops up his head one day and says, I'm the Mahdi, you find a thousand people or two thousand people walking behind them. Because all of this information and false information and theories and ideas that don't have knowledge and don't have a hadith to back them up, the reality of it is that it takes you away from, the re from knowing what's really going to happen. And so you're in danger of falling into something because you've convinced yourself that it's something other than what it is. And an example of that are people who talk about the Dajjal as a system and not as a person. And as we're going to hear from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is no doubt and it is not permissible for anyone to doubt that the Dajjal is a human being. And we're going to hear that clearly from the Ahadith, but that's another issue. The other concern is if we go down the road of interpreting Islam how we feel like it. So we just take any word in Islam like Dajjal and we change it into something else. The Prophet ﷺ said person and we say no it's not a person, it's a, it's a system, it's a conspiracy, it's a group of people, it's everything that has an eye on it, it's so on and so forth. What happens if you apply that to the rest of Islam? What happens to your salah? Your salah doesn't have any meaning anymore, it's not four raka'at or two raka'at, just put your hands up, make dua and go home. What's the, you stopped, none of the words have any meaning and we start falling into the belief of the Batiniya, which is basically to say that everything that is obvious in Islam has a hidden secret meaning that means something completely different. So Dajjal doesn't mean Dajjal, it means the financial system. The reality is once you say that, Salah doesn't mean Salah, it means Dua. And Zakah doesn't mean Zakah, it just means being pure. And Hajj doesn't mean Hajj, it means going on holiday. Where do you stop? Where do the rules of Islam stop when you interpret Islam like that and you take every word and just change it around and pick your own interpretation and bring it out without any knowledge? And from the people are those who Allah told, about, told us about. There are some people who argue about Allah without guidance, without knowledge, and without scripture. And sadly, a lot of people who talk about this topic, that's the angle they come from. It sounds really interesting, it gets you really excited. Having said that, I'm now gonna show you the balance and go on the opposite side. There is no doubt that the shayateen al-insi wal-jinn support each other. Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍّ عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِّ يُوحِي بَعْضُهُمْ إِلَى بَعْضٍ زُخْرُفَ الْقَوْلِ غُرُورًا We have made for every prophet enemies from the jinn. Human beings and the shayateen from the jinn and the human beings. And they reveal to each other speech in order to deceive people. So there is no doubt that the shayateen al-insi wal-jinn are together cooperating with each other. بعضهم أولياء بعض. They are helpers to one another and supporters to one another. And there's no doubt that they have some plans that are bad for Islam and the Muslims. إِنَّهُمْ يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدًا وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدًا وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهِ وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرَهُمْ وَعِنْدَ اللَّهِ مَكْرُهُمْ And the ayat are so many on this topic about the plots and plans of the disbelievers. We don't deny that whatsoever. And we don't deny that there are some people who when they read this story of the Masih al-Dajjal, they wish for the Dajjal to come and they wish to support and help him. And that is something which you shouldn't be surprised about because even Ibn Sayyad has statements like this that he said, that if I could be in his place, I would take it. So ultimately this idea that there are people who support this or who are furthering this, there is no doubt the shayateen, all of them help each other and all of them want to see Islam fail and fall. So there is not, no surprise that they should help each other. There is no surprise that the way the world is working right now and the way that things are happening right now is conducive to the coming of the Masih al-Dajjal. Of course it is, because that's what the Prophet ﷺ told us. He told us about the killing. He told us about the situation, the furqa, 
the, the time when the people will be all split among each other and fighting each other. He told us about the prevalence of certain sins that will be present at that time. He told us many things that tell us that these things are coming prior to the Masih al-Dajjal. But we're not gonna go beyond that into theories and ideas and conspiracies that don't have any evidence because ultimately we are gonna be asked Yawm al-Qiyamah about what we said. And we're gonna be asked about the knowledge that we had and what we did with it. So it's really important that we take this seriously and we speak from the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that being said as an introduction, I'm just going to start to go through parts of the story. I'm going to try and do it in some kind of chronological order. I'm going to base it upon the hadith, but I'm not going to read you the hadith, hadith by hadith, simply because we would run out of time. We wouldn't have time to finish it tonight. But if we can just highlight certain points, the first thing we're going to highlight, and this is one of the big things you have to take away, is how serious this fitna will be. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that there has never been a trial since Allah spread out or since Allah created the offspring of Adam. And there will not be a trial until the hour comes greater than the trial of the Dajjal. So let's start by talking about some things in this hadith. First of all, let's get some, let's get some, uh, some terminology right because we have three main things that we want to define here. We want to say what is a Dajjal and what is or who is Al-Masih and who is the Mahdi. If we know what these three words are roughly, then we can help to understand the story as we go through it bit by bit. So, First of all, the word Dajjal in Arabic, it comes with a meaning which is similar to Kaddab, someone who is a severe liar. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned that there will be a number of minor, you can call them minor or lesser Dajjal figures that will come in or during time. And they will claim prophethood they will claim prophethood. And there were some who claimed prophethood in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like Musaylama, who was known as Musaylama al-Kathab, Musaylama the liar, because he claimed prophethood during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After that, many others have come who have said that they are prophets or claim to be prophets. Some of the scholars said it's not claiming to be a prophet that actually makes them from the type, from the Dajjal, from the, those minor categories of Dajjal. It's those who claim it and have a following. Because if you actually count the number, there's way more than 30. We're talking about a significant number of, you know, probably there are crazy people all over the world every day that come up and say, I'm a prophet, I'm the Mahdi, I'm so on, I'm so, and whatever it might be. But which ones count among the ones that the Prophet ﷺ counted? The scholars, they say the ones that their message gained a following. People actually accepted it from them and some people believed in them and followed them and took them to be a prophet. These minor liars, they don't have the characteristics that the major one has. They don't have kafir written on their forehead. They don't have these huge uh, tests and trials that they bring, but their big test and trial is that they claim prophethood and they lie. And the way that we get away from their uh, trial is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said, He said, I'm the last of all of the prophets and you are the last of all of the nations. This is one of the main ways you can get away from those. Because once you remember that there is no Prophet coming after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you can easily escape all of those Dajjal figures, the minor ones, who they come and they say, I am a Prophet, and they get a following of people who believe them to be a Prophet. But in reality, there is no prophet after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At this point, someone might ask a very intelligent question and say, but what about Isa? 
You keep telling me there's no prophet after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I understand that Isa came before him. But if Isa is going to come again, surely he is another prophet. And that's how some of the false prophets, even the Dajjal himself will actually play on this. That I'm, okay, you said that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the last prophet. But Isa is going to come. So there is some room for, for believing in another prophet, right? After that, no. Why? Isa is not going to come as a prophet. Isa is going to come as a sign. And that's why the scholars, they say, Yenzilu aya. He will come as a sign. He will not come down as a Nabi. He is a Nabi and a Rasul. He's a, he's a prophet and a messenger. But he, he, when he comes back to earth, that will not be his job and his role to be a prophet or a messenger. His job and his role will be as an ayah, as a sign of the coming of the hour. And he will have a role that we're going to hear about in the story relating to the false Masih al-Dajjal. Okay, what about this word Masih? Everyone knows the word Masih it comes from Mas, and Masih it means to wipe. The scholars differed over the usage of the word but we can say that even the word itself, when you apply it to the Dajjal, Al-Masih Al-Dajjal, it has a different meaning to when you apply it to Isa, who is Al-Masih Isa ibn Maryam. So we have two messiahs. We have a messiah who is a false messiah, Masihun Dajjal, Kadhab, a lying false messiah, who we call the Dajjal, and we have a true Messiah, Al-Masih, who is, which is one of the titles given to Isa. Allah Azawajal gave it to him in the Quran that he is called Al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam. With regard to Isa, many of the scholars said the name Masih, what it means is that he would wipe, one of his miracles is that he would wipe, he would wipe over a person and they would become healthy by the permission of Allah or a dead person and they would come back to life by the permission of Allah and he would do that by wiping over them some of the scholars they mentioned this with regard to the Dajjal the Dajjal doesn't wipe anything and bring it back to life we're going to hear the limited tests and trials that Dajjal has about death and life we're going to hear about those but he doesn't have what Isa had he's not sent as a as a copy of Isa in fact that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in, in the beginning of the, in the end of this hadith, he said, وَإِنَّهُ لَا يَضُرُّ مُسْلِمًا He will never harm a Muslim. And the reason for that is anyone who has knowledge can clearly differentiate between the false Masih and the Masih Isa ibn Maryam. And even the abilities that they were given by Allah are very different. So this word Masih, for, with regard to the Dajjal, it's said that it refers to his eye being covered. His eye as though it's been wiped over or it's been covered. And they said that this is where the name Masih, it came from him, Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. And it's claimed that also that it's because he claims to be Al-Masih Isa ibn Maryam. He claims to be Al-Masih the Messiah or he claims to be the Prophet. It's interesting because when I went through the detail of what they showed in that series, to be honest with you, what they showed even there, it doesn't, it, it isn't similar to the story of the Masih al-Dajjal. In all honesty, the maximum that they show, it could qualify as a minor Dajjal. It doesn't, like, it doesn't reach the level of the Masih al-Dajjal. But what they did is they just took elements from it, from the, from the story of the Masih al-Dajjal, and some elements from the Christian aspect of it, and more, more than anything, they put across a message that you, of doubt, of not being certain. The whole idea of that series by the end of time you watch it is that you have no idea, is this guy really what he says he is, or is he not what he says he is? Is he lying? Is he telling the truth? And some people are fooled, and then they believe him, and then they don't. And that aspect there, it, it's a sign of people without knowledge. And actually, when you know the story, you become very clear about who the Masih al-Dajjal is the, and who the minor Dajjal or liars are and who the Masih Isa ibn Maryam is. 
And those three things will not mix up. As for the Mahdi, because we said before we start, we should mention, we're going to come to the description of the Prophet describing the Mahdi. But the Mahdi is not Isa, nor is he the Dajjal. He is a third He's a third figure in the story, a third figure in this event that is going to come. And he is a righteous man from the family of the Prophet wasallam, from the offspring of Fatima radiallahu anha. And he will be the leader of the Muslims at the time when the Dajjal or the time when Isa will descend. And we'll go into that in the story, but just so you have the idea of separate figures and you don't mix them up. Interestingly or surprisingly in that series, they managed to get the main actor to be whose name is Mahdi. So it's all just very conf it's all just designed to confuse you. You know, who is Mahdi and who is Isa and who is the Masih and who is the Dajjal and who is and what is all of this? And it's just designed to be very confusing. And Islam is not confusing at all. The Prophet, وسلم, he told us how many prophets warned their ummah against the Dajjal. He said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمْ يَبْعَثْ نَبِيًّا إِلَّا حَضَّرَ أُمَّتَهُ الدَّجَّالِ He said, Allah never sent any prophet except that he warned his ummah about the Dajjal. And the Prophet ﷺ warned us more than them. He described him in a way that no other prophet described him before. Why was that? The other prophets, their job was to inform that something like this would happen. But because they knew that their nations would not actually live through it, they didn't need the details. They just had to tell, look, there will be a false Messiah that will come and claim to be a prophet. And then he will claim to be your Lord and so on and so forth. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, huwa kharijun fi kum la mahala. He's definitely going to appear among you. He's going to appear among you. And the Prophet ﷺ, he didn't know when he was going to come. He said, if he comes when I am here, I will defend or I will argue with him on behalf of all of you. I will argue with him on behalf of all of you. But if he comes after my death, then every Muslim must defend himself. Everybody is responsible, like he said, Everyone is responsible for putting forth his own argument. And the basic principle is that you have to avoid the Dajjal. You have to escape the Dajjal. And we're going to come to this also in the story, but it's important to highlight right from the beginning that you have to, your aim is not to confront the Dajjal. Your aim is to keep away because it's a fitna. And the principle of a fitna is you get away from it if you can. And that's why it's narrated that the Mahdi and the Muslims will be in the mountains in Syria. And they will try to escape the Dajjal. And then Isa will come and the Dajjal will come. So this tells us that it, the principle is not that we go to argue or to present our case or to test our faith or I'm going to go and show how much I know. But the idea is that you keep away from it and you run away from him. Where will he come out from? Now, this is where it gets interesting. Um, I don't think that there was a real misconception in this. They didn't really make it clear where, they, where this individual came from, but it seemed like he maybe he comes from Jordan, maybe he comes from Palestine or anything like that. That's a misconception. He comes from Khurasan. He comes from Khurasan. From a way between Asham wal Iraq. Asham is the Levant, and that's the area of Syria, Jordan, uh, Palestine, and so on. That's what we call Asham. And Iraq is, of course, next to it. And in between the two is northern Iraq, is what we would call northern Iraq, roughly speaking. That is the area which is between Syria, between Sham and Iraq, the, the part of Syria which is closest to Iraq and the part of Iraq which is closest to, which is closest to Syria. That is Bain al-Sham wal Iraq. But it's narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, He will come fi Yahudiyati Asbahan. He will come among the Jews of Asfahan or Asbahan. Asfahan is a city which is now in Iran. 
And Iran still has a fairly big uh, Jewish population in it. So it's not surprising that he might come out from among a Jewish population in Iran. That's not surprising. It still has a large Jewish population in it. But he will come out from a way between Asham and Iraq, between Syria and Iraq, broadly speaking. But he will be followed by 70,000 of the Jews of Asfahan, as the Prophet وسلم, said. And we believe exactly as the Prophet وسلم, said. How will that happen? How are the, does that number exist already? What does it mean? You don't need to do that. You just need to understand that he will come out among 70,000 of the Jews from Asfahan. And that he will come from away between Syria and Iraq. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I'm going to describe him to you in a way that no Prophet described him before. And this is where it gets really important. What is the first thing that the Dajjal is going to say? The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّهُ يَبْدَأُ فَيَقُولُ أَنَا نَبِيٌ وَلَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِي He's going to begin by saying, I'm a Prophet, but there will be no Prophet after me. Again, just to highlight the sort of misconceptions that people may, might have took from that program or that series. It's not the case that he ever really says that he's a prophet or he ever really stands. He alludes to it or indicates at times, but doesn't even really say it. The Dajjal is much clearer than that. The Masih Dajjal will openly say to the people, Ana Nabi, I am a prophet. How do you mentally counter that? How do you escape that? You remember what the Prophet ﷺ, he said, وَلَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِي There is no Prophet going to come after me. Then he will say, أَنَا رَبُّكُمْ وَلَا تَرَوْنَ رَبَّكُمْ حَتَّى تَمُوتُوا Then he will say, I am your Lord. And this is again something which is not wasn't portrayed about the Dajjal in that way. That the Dajjal is going to go through a two-step process. The first step is he says, I'm a prophet. The second step is he says, I am your Lord. And you will not see your Lord until you die. So far, the Prophet ﷺ gave three solutions to saving yourself from the Dajjal. Or four so far. Number one, he said, لا يضر مسلمة. He's not going to harm a Muslim. So the first thing that is going to save you is sticking to your Islam and holding fast onto your Islam and your Iman. That's the first thing. The second thing is to know his description because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I'm going to describe him to you in a way that no Prophet has described him before. The third thing is to remember that there is no Prophet after the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. And the fourth thing is to remember that you will not see your Lord until you die. So no matter what you see, no matter if he brings to you Jannah and Jahannam, no matter if he brings to you all of the treasures of the earth, ultimately if you remember that there's no Prophet after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we're not going to see Allah until we die, then you will not be able to be confused. And if you have that Islam and you hold fast to that Islam, then he's not going to harm you and you'll be able to see written on his forehead as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that written on his forehead is kafir. Everyone will read it whether they are literate or illiterate. In some narrations it says everyone who hates his deeds will read it. Everyone who hates him will read it. And in others it said every Muslim will read it. It will be written on his forehead, kafir. So we understood what he's going to say first and what he's going to say second. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he described him and he said he is a'war. He is a'war, he is one-eyed. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Inna rabbakum laysa bi a'war. Your Lord is not one-eyed. And that is, I think, the fifth thing that we came to, to remember how to save yourself from the Dajjal, is to remember that your Lord is not one-eyed. So if you see someone claiming to be your Lord and that person has one eye, 
You can just remember, and someone might say, well, obviously, if I see a person, I will not think it's my Lord. But with the fitna and all of the following, and you've seen like one of the things at least you can take from this recent you know, thing that happened with this Messiah is that you can take how quickly everybody gets and joins the hype. But just by remembering very simply and just by keeping in your mind that your Lord is not one-eyed, your Lord is not one-eyed, this is a means that you can protect yourself from the Dajjal. The Prophet he described him and he said that his left eye is, it is, uh, it is wiped or blind. There is a piece of flesh which is thick covering his left eye. And his right eye is like a floating grape. In other words, it protrudes. His, his, eye, his other eye protrudes and his left eye is covered with a thick piece of skin so that he's blind in one eye. He's awr. He's one-eyed. He's blind in one eye. Now here also, this is a response to those people who say that the Dajjal, for example, is everything with one eye on. But the reality is that's not how the Prophet ﷺ described him. Many things are called awar. Many, the word awar has been used for how many hundreds of thousands of people before or things that you said, oh, it's awar, it's one-eyed. And in reality, this issue of it being one-eyed like that, I, it's not something which is in itself significant. But if you see the description that one of the eyes would be covered by a piece of flesh, and the other one will be like a protruding, will be protruding like a floating grape, then from that you can see the difference. The Prophet ﷺ described his hair. He didn't describe him as a system. He described his hair. He said, he mentioned uh, regarding, he mentioned two things regarding his hair. He mentioned that it would be th thick and twisted and curly. Thick and twisted and curly. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّهُ shabun." إِنَّهُ شَابٌ قَطَطْ He will be a young man. A young man. So again, this idea that the Dajjal is some kind of group or some kind of organization, he will be a young man. He will have twisted, curly, thick hair. Between his two eyes will be written the word kathir, as we said. And of course, when he makes such a big claim, Unlike what is being sort of pushed around the moment of this like, will it be like a claim where you're not really sure what he's really saying and you're not really clear, is he? He will make an obvious claim. He will say, I'm a prophet. And then he will say, I'm your Lord. And he will be told to bring evidences. And what he's going to bring are going to be trials from Allah Azza wa Jal that are going to test the faith of the people. From the things that he will bring is that he will have two rivers. One of them, as the eye sees it, as your eye sees it, will be ma'un abyad, clear water. The other will be a fire that will be boiling or a burning fire, according to your eye. But the Prophet ﷺ, he told us that his fire will be water and his water will be fire. And he said, whoever He said, whoever is tested by his fire, let him seek Allah's help. So this is, I think we're up to number six from the ways of keeping away from the Dajjal, that if you're tested by him, you seek Allah's help. You seek Allah's help. And let him read the opening of Surah Al-Kahf. For it will be his protection or it will be your protection against all of his trial. The beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. One practical thing that we can do for our kids Make sure that our children at least know the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. Sometimes mention the first 10 ayat or the first, you know, the first beginning. And some of the scholars, they mention the end because some of the narrations mention the end of Surah Al-Kahf. So if they know the, the first 10 ayahs and the last 10 ayahs of Surah Al-Kahf to be safe, and they understand that when you see these trials, 
and this fitna and you feel scared and you feel like you don't know what to do, recite the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. If you then do that and you lower your head, close your eyes, like the Prophet he said, you close your eyes, you lower your head into the fire that is with the Dajjal and you recite the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf, the fire will become water and the water will become fire. So everything with him is opposite. <coughs> From the trials that he will have is that he will appear to punish people who don't believe in him. And one of the ways that he will do that is he will pass by a group of people who don't believe in him and he will command the heavens to withhold its rain and the ground to become dry. Of course, this is not in his hands. This is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. But the way that his trial will be is that he will appear that he is the one who withheld those things from them. And so when the next group of people believe in him, the next tribe, they believe in him, the rain will fall and their cows will be, you know, they will have livestock and cattle. And those who don't believe in him, their livestock would die. This is part of the tests and the trials. But you remember, you stick to those basic things that we, that we talked about. He will walk through the desert and say, bring forth your treasures and the treasures will come out like a swarm of bees. All of this, are th all of these things are things that Allah Azza wa Jal has given the Masih al-Dajjal the ability to test the people with. To test the people with. And the Masih al-Dajjal is a disbeliever. That's why written on his forehead is kafir. But Allah has given him a certain ability to test people. And that's not surprising because that is also has a precedent that Allah Azza wa Jal would give, for example, Iblis the ability to cause certain problems for certain people in order to be a test for them or a trial for them. So it's not that the Dajjal is coming with miracles. The Dajjal is simply being given a certain ability which is not the norm, which is outside of what we normally understand in order to test the people as to whether they will believe in Allah Azza wa Jal or whether they will believe in Him. One of the things the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned is he mentioned the battle that will take place before, immediately before the Dajjal. Actually, immediately before the Dajjal, there are two main signs that the Dajjal is about to come. One is a famine. In the first year of a three-year famine, the earth will withhold a third of its normal harvest. In the second year, it will go to double. And then in the final year, it will withhold all of its harvest and the people will have nothing except to say La ilaha illallah and subhanallah and Allahu Akbar and so on. That's all the people will have to nourish them during that time. That's one of the sort of immediate signs that the Dajjal is about to come. On top of that is the fighting between our room and between the Muslims. Now here is where a lot of people go off the track. And I tell you why, for a very simple reason. I'm not talking about people being deviant or crazy, but just generally, why do people go off the track? Because the Ro Arum have fought against the Muslims previously. And in fact, they fought against the Muslims several times over history. So it's not right to say that every time there's a fight in Syria that involves Arum, for example, that that means that we are definitely in the time of the Dajjal and so on and so forth. In reality, this is something that has happened several times in history. The Prophet wasallam fought against Arum and they were a power in the time of the Prophet wasallam and the Sahaba and then after that. So who are Arum? Generally, when the, we use the word Arum in Arabic, we refer to not necessarily the Romans as such, but what we normally call the Eastern Romans. That is what is sometimes called the Byzantines or the Eastern Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was divided into two, the Western half, which is sort of the Italy and you know what came into the West of Europe and the Eastern Roman Empire, which is kind of more like the Southern part and Greece and uh, maybe you can say Turkey and those kind of like that sort of region was the region of the East and even Syria for a long time was under the power of the Byzantines, the Eastern Roman Empire. So that is what is meant by a room, generally speaking. And that's what's meant in the Surah, Huri but room. And it's not referring to the Western Roman Empire. 
Although some of the scholars, you could include it, you know, you could include it. So it doesn't, but this idea that, you know, for example, people interpreting that Arum refers to uh, Russia and that Ya'juj and Ma'juj refers to China and all of these crazy theories, this has no evidence for it. Has no evidence not in the Sunnah, not in the book, of, in the Quran, nor in the Sunnah. Rather, Arum, as it was known by the Prophet وسلم, and the Sahaba, was the Eastern Roman Empire, what is known as the Byzantine Empire, that is generally based around what was based around Greece and, and maybe you can say southern Italy, possibly Greece and onwards in that area, Turkey and that part of Turkey which is in towards Europe. That is all of that is the is what was known as the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire. And that's what the Arabs referred to as Arum. Will they be the ones to fight the Muslims before the coming of the Dajjal? Or will it be all of Europe, including the Eastern and the Western parts? Allah Azza wa knows best. We don't need to speculate on that. And not every time that Europe takes up arms against the Muslims should we say that this is that what the Prophet ﷺ told us about, about this and, and so on and so forth. Because the reality is, it is something that happens and has happened many times. When will it happen for the Dajjal? It's something you should be scared about when you hear. When you hear that the Europeans or you hear that the, uh, the whatever you want to call that area which is south of the Mediterranean, whenever you hear that they have entered into a sham and they are fighting against the Muslims, for sure you should fear that. You should be scared. You should fear that this might be what the Prophet foretold would happen and that immediately after that battle comes the Masih al-Dajjal. But this is very dangerous and it's been used even by the likes of Daesh and others to claim that they're upon the truth. Why? Because they claim that when the non-Muslims entered Syria to fight, we were the ones fighting against them. So we must be the ones mentioned in the hadith who are the martyrs. So we must be the people of paradise who are going to fight against the Dajjal, so and so on and so forth. So you can see the danger of a person going down that route before they have knowledge of what's going to happen. But there is no doubt that the Muslims will fight against Arum in Sham and that that battle will happen immediately prior to the coming of the Masih al-Dajjal. And it's very scary to see that that area of the world right now is so unsettled and so, uh, so much fighting is happening and so, much, uh, so many people are being killed because it makes you fear that this is only just a precursor to what is going to come before this battle will happen and before finally the, uh, before finally the, uh, the Masih al-Dajjal would come. But some of the things why you can know that the statement that they made about them fighting a Rom was wrong is that it's mentioned that the detachment that will fight against Rome will come from al Medina, Not that they will come from the people of that place, but they will be gathered in Medina and from Medina they will go out to fight against a room that will land, uh, that will land in uh, Dabiq or it will land in, uh, in a part of Syria which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. So how long will the Dajjal remain upon the earth? The Prophet ﷺ said he will remain 40 days. A day like a year and a day like a month and a day like Jumu'ah i.e. like a week, and when he says like a Jumu'ah, it means like a week, and the rest of his days will be ordinary days. So that's a day like a year, a day like a Hijri year, a day like a Hijri month, a day like a week, and the rest of the days will be ordinary, the rest of the 37 days will be 37 ordinary days. This hadith, I believe, has one of the biggest benefits in it that you can take ah, completely from the whole thing. And this hadith alone has the perfect cure to all of these misconceptions in it. And maybe nobody or very few people spot it. The answer is in what the Sahaba asked. When the Prophet ﷺ said this, the Sahaba asked, you know, like any other question, what did they ask? How should we pray? in the day that's like a year. Look at how they're con what they were thinking about and what everyone else is thinking about. 
What color hat will he wear? What color eyes will he have? What, vi what countries will he visit? You know, all these kind of questions, but ultimately, what did the Sahaba say when they heard this? Oh, Messenger of Allah, how do we pray in the day that's like a year? That was all that was on their mind. Never mind him, leave the Dajjal at the side. I want to know how, to, how should I pray in the day that's like a year? Should I pray only five times or should I pray according to the passage of the year? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, rather you must approximate the time and pray accordingly. Meaning you pray as though it's a year, not as though it is a day. You approximate the time. You make taqdeer of the time and you approximate it, you, you calculate it and you try to calculate the prayer times and pray accordingly. Likewise, in the day that is a month, you pray a month's worth of prayers. You don't pray a day's worth of prayers. And the day that's like a week, you pray a week's worth of prayers, but you estimate it and you calculate it. And that shows exactly the mentality of the Sahaba. And in all honesty, if that was our mentality, then we would be a lot safer than we are. Because that mentality of caring more about Islam and more about your salah and your relationship with Allah than about the you know, stories and ideas and theories and things that people have. But he will move very fast upon the earth. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned that he will walk on the earth. He didn't mention that he will ride. Now we know there are many different means of transport uh, and there are proper Arabic words that could be used for any of them. But what we have in the hadith is that yamshi fil ard, he will walk upon the earth. But the Prophet ﷺ said he will walk at the speed of the clouds being driven by the wind. How will that be? Again, we don't need to go any further into that. Is that some technology? Is that something that he's been given? Does he just disappear and appear somewhere else? Uh, will he just have this ability to just sort of float through the air? We don't have any information except that he will walk on the earth and he will walk at a speed that is like the wind being driven by the clouds. Where will he not go? There are four places he will not go. And some of the ahadith mention uh, more than that. But there are certain places that the, that, that the Dajjal will not go. There are certain places that he will, that he will not go. He will create a great disorder because the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that he will have, he will make a great disorder to his left and to his right. To his left and his right. In other words, he's going to everything, he's going to create a huge uh, chaos, a huge hype around him everywhere. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, no place of earth will be left except that he will tread in it and overcome it except for Masajid, Makkah and Medina. That is the Masjid in Makkah and the Masjid in Medina. So far we're talking about Masajid, so far, so far. We're going to come to other narrations. The Masjid of Makkah, the Masjid of Medina, At-Tur, the Mount At-Tur and the Masjid, Masjid Al-Aqsa. Now it doesn't mention in this narration Bayt Al-Maqdis, Jerusalem, but it mentions Masjid Al-Aqsa, that the Masjid Al-Aqsa itself will be a place that he will not tread inside and he will not be able to conquer it. However, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in another hadith, he said, there will not be any city except the fear of the Dajjal will enter it, except Medina. So Medina will be the only city in which the, there will be no fear of the Dajjal. The people within it will not be fearful. And perhaps that relates to a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Iman will return to Medina like the lizard returns to its hole. That Im gradually as time progresses, Iman will Iman will concentrate itself in Medina. But for any, whatever the reason, he will not be able to enter Medina. On the roads to Medina and the gates to Medina, there will be 
gates or there will be roads and the angels, two angels will be standing at each one with unsheathed swords repelling the fear of the Dajjal from it. And it's interesting because many of the hadith mention that Dajjal will be turned, his face will be turned by the angels. In other words, he doesn't have, it's not, he, he can't overcome with, or he can't just do whatever he wants. Rather, there will be angels who are there to ensure that he doesn't step over what Allah has decreed that he is to do. He will, though, land near to Medina. And when he lands near to Medina, on the outskirts of Medina, behind Mount Uhud, Medina will shake with three uh, great uh, earthquakes, and many men and women will come out and they will join the Dajjal. And it's mentioned that many of them among the people that will go out will be among the women. And that's why especially we have to educate our wives and our daughters as well, and not just educate our sons and our, uh, our brothers and so on. We have to educate everybody in our family about this because of the danger. Because emotionally, it's very easy to get caught up in the trial of the Dajjal. At that time, we hear about a man from Medina who will go out. And this man we haven't spoke about, but he features in this story. And I think it's worth mentioning the story, even though we're trying to be as quick as we can, that he will come out in the flush of youth. And he will go to the Dajjal, and when he reaches the area of the Dajjal, the Dajjal's men, his army will be there. The army will seize him. And they will decide to kill him, because he's obviously, it's obvious that this young man who's come out, this young uh, man, righteous man, is a Muslim. But they will remember that the Dajjal had commanded them not to kill anyone without bringing them to him first. So then they will bring them before him, and this young man will be brought before the Dajjal. Will be brought before the Dajjal. When he reaches him, he will say, O people, I bear witness that he is the Dajjal about whom Allah's messenger has mentioned his hadith and informed us about. First of all, I want to highlight something so important in this. That young man, where did he get that knowledge from? He got it by the text of the hadith. He got it from the hadith of the Prophet That's how he knew that the one in front of him was the Dajjal and not Al-Masih Isa ibn Maryam. He knew this because of the hadith. And when he knew about the hadith, he said, this is the Dajjal about whom Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about in his hadith or who he informed us about. The Dajjal will then command for him to be killed and he will be struck on his back and his stomach and then the Dajjal will say to his followers that if I kill him and raise him alive, will you believe? Will there be any doubt? They will say no. So he will take a saw and he will cut that man with a saw from where his hair parts down to the middle of his legs. He will cut him in half. And then he will put those pieces at the distance between an archer and his target. Then he will say, stand. And that man will come and stand up as though he was never cut. This is not an illusion, it's not an illusionary trick, and you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't uh, misunderstand this because this is one of the misconceptions I picked up on, is that this every Dajjal that will come will just be someone who studied how to do illusionary tricks and how to do little magic tricks and things like that. This is something that he will be able to do because Allah Azza wa has made this test and trial for the people. So he will say stand, and the man will come standing. Then he will say to the man, don't you believe in me? Don't you believe in me? And that man, he will say a, an amazing statement. He will say, Wallahi, he will say, Wallahi, Mazdad tu fika illa basira. 
I have just become even more sure that you are the Dajjal. Why? Because he knows the hadith. And he knows that this will happen and he knows. So he said, you've only just made me more sure that you are the Dajjal. So now the Dajjal will show his limits. So he will say, I'm going to kill him. So he will catch him to kill him and strike his neck with a sword. But his neck will become hard like molten metal. And the Dajjal will not be able to kill him. So now in front of his followers, he's showing that he can't do the job. So he will pick him and he will throw him. At that point, the followers will imagine that he's been thrown into, Jahan into Jahannam. When in reality, he has entered into Jannah and he is from the best of the shuhada, uh, from the best of the martyrs. The Prophet ﷺ said he will be the most eminent among the people with regard to being martyred in the eyes of Rabbul Alameen, in the eyes of Allah Azza wa Jal. At this point, now we come to the part where the Mahdi and Isa ibn Maryam uh, become a part of the story. Because until now, we've only heard chronologically about the Dajjal. At this point, where are the Muslims? The majority of the Muslims, some of them are in Medina. Some have taken refuge in the places where the Dajjal will not go, like we, we talked about the four mosques and so on. We don't know if any of the Muslims will be in all of those mosques. Will there be Muslims hiding in Al-Aqsa? Or We don't know that for sure. But we know that many of the Muslims will have fled into the mountains to escape him. And they will at that time have a leader. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِمَامُهُمْ رَجُلٌ صَالِحٌ Before he said, he said, وَيَفِرُّ النَّاسُ مِنَ الدَّجَّالِ فِي الْجِبَالِ the people will run away from the Dajjal into the mountains. And this will happen in Sham, in, in the Levant. So in this area of the Levant, in what is actually Syria, because we have a hadith that mentions Damascus, it mentions Damascus, that they will flee into the mountains. When they are in the mountains, they will have an imam, a leader. And that leader will be a righteous man. The Prophet ﷺ said about him, Al Mahdi Minna Al Mahdi Minna Ahlul Bayt. The Mahdi is one of us from Ahlul Bayt. From the Aula Min Auladi Fatima, from the children of Fatima radiallahu anha. Allah Azza wa Jal will make him right in a night. Meaning that Allah will give him the qualities to become the leader of the Muslims in one night. It will not be something that was building over years and years and years. Rather, it's something that very suddenly he will become the leader of the Muslims. When he is the leader of the Muslims, and the Prophet ﷺ said that his name, Ismuhu, he said, Ismuhu Smi, his name is my name. Wasmu Abihi, Ismu Abi, and his father's name is my father's name. In other words, his name will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Does that mean that everyone who says that their name, or everyone whose name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah, then they say, I'm the Mahdi, or everyone who says their name is Muhammad, and then they say, I'm the Mahdi, that is not at all what we hear about the Mahdi at all. We don't hear ever the Mahdi standing up in front of the people and saying, I'm the Mahdi, come behind me. What we hear is that in one night, he will suddenly, Allah Azza wa Jal will place within him the ability to lead the people. And he will become the leader and the imam of the people and he will be an imam from Quraysh. From Quraysh, as the Prophet ﷺ told us, that the leadership will remain with Quraysh. He will be in charge or he will remain in charge of the Muslims for seven years and he will fill the earth with justice as it was filled with oppression and tyranny. But here again, a lot of the false things that we hear about the Mahdi, of course, come from uh, Shiism and the Shia generally, Tashayyar generally, they have some of the most crazy ideas about the Mahdi. And generally speaking, and they more or less worship the Mahdi as a, a, some kind of divine being and who has a higher status to those of the Prophets or, and the Messengers The reality is that the Mahdi is Rajulun Salih, he's not a Nabi, he's not a Prophet. 
And that is why when Isa will come and Isa will descend upon a minaret in Damascus. And when he descends and he comes down to the Mahdi, the Mahdi will move back for Isa to lead the Salah. And Isa is more righteous in the sight of Allah than the Mahdi. And better in the sight of Allah because he's a prophet. He's a prophet and he is from Ulul Azmi min al Rusul, the five best prophets. So Isa has that priority. But when the Mahdi starts to step back to let Isa lead the prayer, Isa will touch him on between his shoulder blades and push him forward. And he will mention that Allah Azza wa Jal, as an honor to your Ummah, has kept leadership within you. In other words, Allah will not give leadership to someone outside of your people. Someone coming from the outside, even though that one coming from the outside is a prophet. But because he's coming from the outside, he's from Bani Israel. Allah Azza wa Jal has honored the people of Quraysh and the Muslims that their leader will be, will remain someone who is one of them and will not be handed outside to Isa to lead the Muslims. Rather, Isa will judge among the Muslims by the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He will not judge by the Torah and the Injil. <coughs> As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, when the Imam will go backwards, then it, and indicate that Isa will come forwards. Then Isa will put his hand between his shoulder and say, No, you have some of you put over others as an honor from Allah to this people. So their Imam will lead them in prayer as their Imam. So what about Isa? How does Isa look? The Prophet wasallam said, when the Mahdi comes forward to lead the dawn prayer, Salat al-Subh, the Fajr prayer, at that time, Isa ibn Maryam will descend from the heavens. He will descend on the white minaret on the eastern side of Damascus, wearing two garments lightly dyed with saffron and placing his hands on the wings of two angels. When he lowers his head, there will be beads of sweat that fall from his head and when he raises it up, beads like pearls will scatter. Every non-believer who smells the smell of his body will die and his breath will reach as far as he is able to see. That's none of that is described with the Dajjal. Notice how the description is completely different. There is nothing about Isa described like that. He said, the Prophet ﷺ said, when you see him, recognize him. A man of medium height. He said he is... Marbu'a. Marbu'a is someone of medium height and build. Not extremely tall or extremely short, not extremely sort of broad or extremely thin. Someone who is kind of balanced, medium height and medium build, we call them marbu'a. He is a person who is marbu'a, is of medium height and build. He is reddish fair. Reddish fair. So the Prophet ﷺ described Isa that he is wal bayat. He has a red kind of skin with some white in it, like a light colored skin that is reddish. And he will be wearing two light yellow garments dyed with saffron, looking as though drops are falling from his head, although his hair will not be wet. He will fight the people for Islam. He will break the cross and kill the pig and abolish the jizya and Allah will make all of the religions perish except Islam. And this is where I want to just stop and we're getting towards the end of the story now, not too much longer, maybe 10 more minutes or so. But this is where I want to stop and focus on something. Look at how confused all of the different religions are around Isa and the Dajjal and the last prophet. And this is something that you can actually take from and the whole reason why they were even able to release a series that even got any popularity is to play upon the confusion that exists. So in reality, the Yahud, the Jews, were waiting for a prophet. They were waiting for a prophet and when Isa came to them, they rejected Isa 
And then they were waiting for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And when he came they rejected him So they're waiting still for a Prophet Of which two have come that they haven't recognized The Christians have taken Isa as their Lord Generally speaking as, as a Lord besides Allah And they have also neglected the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So when the Dajjal says to them that I'm your Lord They don't have a problem with the transition from Prophet to Lord because for them, Prophet to Lord is what they believe in the first place about Isa alayhi salam. There is so much confusion around this because all of these different religions. But when Isa finally descends, the Jews will have no excuse. They will not be able to say that we didn't or that this we were waiting for this other, we didn't realize. Nor will the Christians have any excuse to say that or we didn't know and we didn't realize and we thought that it was... At that time, it will become clear in the deen in the Allah Islam, and the only people that will recognize this properly are the Muslims who know their religion from the Hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. At this point, in other ahadith, it is mentioned that the Muslims will be besieged on a mountain in Syria. And it is the next morning that they will make a pledge to fight. And some of them said, some of the commentators mentioned that Isa will lead a different prayer. They said he will lead a prayer in the masjid in uh, Beit al-Maqdis in Jerusalem, but he will not lead the prayer in, he will, not, he will not lead the prayer behind the Mahdi and so on. There are some different narrations in that. But what will happen is that finally, when, the, when Isa has prayed that morning prayer, what will happen is that Isa will open the door and it will be opened. And behind the door will be the Masih al-Dajjal. Will be the Dajjal. And with him will be 70,000 Jews, as we said from the Jews of Asfahan, which is mentioned. Every one of them will have a decorated sword and a green shawl. And Isa will march towards the Dajjal with his spear. When the Dajjal will look at Isa, the Dajjal will start to melt like salt dissolves in water. It will start to dissolve. The Prophet ﷺ said, if Isa left him, then the Dajjal would keep on melting until he would die. He would just melt into nothing. But Allah will kill him with his own hand. And that is a befitting punishment for the one who claimed to be the Lord. That Allah, even Isa will not kill the Dajjal. Isa will appear to kill the Dajjal. He will take his spear as if to kill him. But before that, Allah Azza wa Jal will kill the Dajjal with his own hand. And he will show the blood, he will show Isa the blood of the Dajjal upon his spear. He will find him near a place Uh, he will find him near a place called Bab al-Ludd, al-Sharqi, in the east, the eastern Bab al-Ludd. And Allah Azza wa Jal will kill him at a place which is called Aqabatu Ufayq. It's a place which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. After this, a battle will ensure, will ensure between the followers of the Dajjal of course, the Dajjal now has died between all the followers of the Dajjal and between the Muslims. And that battle will continue until Allah Azza wa Jal makes the Muslims victorious in it. But at this time, Allah Azza wa Jal will send them another test and another trial. And that test and that trial is that Allah Azza wa Jal will reveal to Isa alayhi salam, I have brought forth from my servants a people against none of you will be able to fight. So take your people to At-Tur. So Isa will gather the Muslims and he will take them all to a place called At-Tur. Then Allah will send Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So now we have a fourth group or a fourth uh, sort of set of characters to add to the story and that is Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Ya'juj and Ma'juj are from 
Bani Adam. They are not also aliens or, you know, something like that. They are human beings, but they are extremely, extremely powerful. And Allah reveals to Isa that you will not be able to fight against them. They will swarm from every slope. The first of them will pass the lake of Tiberias and drink out of it. And when the last of them passes, he will say there was once water there. So they will drink an entire lake dry. Then they will reach the mountain of Beit al-Maqdis and they will say, we have killed those on the earth. Let us kill those who are in the sky. And they will throw their arrows towards the sky and the arrows will return covered in blood. Another siege will happen. This siege is not the siege of the Dajjal. This is the siege of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. At the moment here, it mentions Isa will be there. But what is mentioned is Isa will make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal and Allah will send insects which will strike their necks and Ya'juj and Ma'juj will die and then birds which will come and carry them away and throw them wherever Allah wills. Then Allah will send a rain which will enter every house and the earth will bring forth its fruit as it did in the time of Adam السلام, and only Allah will be worshipped War will put down its weapons. The dominion of Quraysh will end. And then Isa, he will pass away. And when he dies, the Muslims will pray his janazah. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, فَيُصَلِّ عَلَيْهِ الْمُسْلِمُونَ The Muslims will pray the janazah over Isa. And when they are in that position, in that state, Allah will send a cold wind min qibl sham from the direction of Sham, which will soothe the people under their armpits. Even under their arms, they will feel the cold, the coolness of that wind. And every Muslim that feels it will die. Every Muslim that, will feel, that feels it will die. And no one will live on the earth having any good or any faith in them. Even the person in the, heart, in the deepest part of the mountain will die from that wind. And only the wicked people will survive and they will be as careless as birds with the characteristics of beasts. They won't appreciate any good and they won't stop any evil. Then shaitan will come to them and they will worship idols based on the command of the shaitan and they will commit adultery like donkeys yeah, and just openly in the streets and they will lead comfortable lives even though this has happened and then the last hour will come to them when they are in this situation and at that point the trumpet will be blown or the horn will be blown and the first time that it is blown and it will only be blown upon the worst of the people everyone all of the muslims will be dead and of course, before that, the Mus'haf will have been taken up. Then the horn will be blown and everyone left on the earth from those wicked people will die. Then it will be blown once again and people will stand up looking around. And that t tells you the link or the timing between Isa and between the rest of the or the coming of the Day of Judgment that is extremely close between the death of Isa السلام, and between the, the, uh, the death of every Muslim and then the worst of the people living is very, very close. And we know the 10 major signs that come at the end, they come in one after the other in rapid succession. One comes, then another, then another, starting with the Masih al-Dajjal. So I hope that even though we haven't really gone into as much detail, but I hope that inshallah ta'ala in this kind of uh, roundabout hour and a half or a little bit more than that, we have answered at least the questions or many of the questions that people would have about this, clarified a lot of misconceptions, uh, shown the reality of who the Dajjal is and who Isa is and who the Mahdi is and who Ya'juj and Ma'juj are. And hopefully try to answer some of the things that you commonly hear people say. But ultimately, what I want you to go away with is the following points. Number one, 
how close this trial is and how dangerous it is. That's the first one. Number two, the basic things that you can do to protect yourself and your family. We talked about your Islam. We talked about uh, the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. We talked about remembering there is no prophet after the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You'll not see your Lord until you die. Your Lord is not one-eyed. We talked about asking Allah's help and protection and running away from the trials of the Dajjal. In a hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentioned, whoever survives the trials before the Dajjal will survive his trial. And that also tells you that even the trials that you're going through today, and even the trials the Muslims are going through today, if you can survive those and keep on surviving the trials and tribulations, then ultimately you will also survive the trial of the Dajjal. We also want you to take away the importance of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and taking this knowledge from the Quran and the Sunnah and not taking it from uh, stories and conspiracies and YouTube videos of people just talking like that. Because the worst thing is that you might not recognize this problem when it comes. And I hope inshallah also you've learned the importance of teaching this to our children so that inshallah ta'ala they will also have that knowledge equipped with them. Because the reality is that this is something that you fear is extremely close. And everything that happens in the news and around the world only just indicates to you that it's getting closer and closer and closer. And you fear that if you don't even experience it then perhaps it will be your children that will experience it. So pass that knowledge, keep that knowledge alive based upon the hadith, based upon the ayat. There is a very nice book which is written on the topic. It's quite comprehensive. Um, it's called uh, The Masih al-Dajjal uh, and The Descent of Isa ibn Maryam. It's available in English. Uh, and it's quite, it's well written by Sheikh al-Albani, rahimullah ta'ala. It's a very beautiful book. And particularly, he has a section, which I think is section five of the book. Yeah, section five, where he tells the story in chronological order based upon the hadith. And there's many points I didn't mention, many things I didn't mention. So inshallah, we go through that, we study it, we learn it, and we teach it to our kids, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. I think also, I hope that you've learned that Netflix is not a reliable source of information about your deen. It's not really something that I would recommend you waste your time watching at all. Because ultimately, what are you going to watch? You're going to watch on anything, whatever TV channel, whatever streaming service it is, what are you going to watch? It's going to be full, full of things which are disbelief, people which are not dressed properly, music, all kinds of haram that is going to be on there. And watching it because it has some connection to Islam is even worse because it's just going to confuse people even more. And I think that really when I went through the story of what they actually put there, the biggest thing that I took out of it is it's just intended to confuse everybody because it's just full of confusion. You don't know what anything really is, or what, and everybody's confused. The Christians are confused, the Jews are confused, the Muslims are confused, and then at the end, it might not be him that's the one, but it might be the other one, and it's all very confusing. The reality is Islam is not confusing. Islam is easy to understand. All you need to do is go to the authentic sources and take it from the authentic sources, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. So that's what Allah Azza wa Jal made easy for me to mention. But I think because we were trying to deal with misconceptions and confusion, we should ask if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask. And if I know the answer, I'll tell you. And if I don't know the answer, then I will try to find out for you, inshallah ta'ala. And maybe we can post a second video to go with this video, inshallah, that would answer any questions that I don't know the answer to today. If anyone had any questions or anything they've heard about it that they would like to ask about, because otherwise you'll never get rid of the misconceptions if you let them sit inside of you like that. It doesn't have to be something you thought, it could be something. Um, will the battle happen during modern times going through stuff? You mentioned like swords. Mm, the, hadith, the hadith do mention swords. The other hadith mention horse riding as well. It mentions that the first people to come across the news of the Dajjal will be horse riders that are the best of the fawaris, of the horse riders of that time. We actually don't know the answer to that. We don't know whether uh, something will happen that will cause people to regress like that, like some kind of event will happen that causes people to lose that, or whether this will be something particular to those people. It, we really don't know the answer, but the hadith clearly <coughs> mentioned swords and people uh, on horseback 
and the Dajjal walking on the earth you, makes you think, where is the technology and so on? There is two options. Either it could be that that's simply not mentioned because the Prophet ﷺ didn't need to mention it. He, doesn't, he, he only needs to mention what, what everybody needs. He doesn't need to confuse people by saying his social media will have this many people, for example, and it, it, it's not needed. Or something will happen that that technology will be lost. And that is also very uh, easily believable because actually just a few, uh, a loss of, you know, a few satellites or whatever, and then, you know, all, all of this technology that you have would just all fall apart, you know? So the reality is that it's very possible that that technology could be lost and people would go back to fighting the way they used to. And it's possible that the Prophet ﷺ simply didn't mention the extra things that will be there because there is no benefit in mentioning that. Uh, he only mentioned what was relevant that everyone in the ummah could understand. Uh, but we, they will fight with swords. It, it's not like a sword will be a gun because there is a word for shooting in Arabic, which the Prophet ﷺ used, and there is a word for sword fighting. So it's not like the two words are interchangeable. Like he, did, he used the word sword. So perhaps the Dajjal will carry a sword for that reason, like a ceremonial type of thing, like I kill people with the sword, you know, sort of thing. And perhaps it will be that people have regressed to fighting with the sword at that time. We, we don't know. But, uh, but that's what the hadith indicate. It only mentions the traditional uh, ways of fighting and the traditional ways of traveling that were known in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wa jazakum Allah khayran wa barakallahu feekum. Wallahu a'lam wa salatu wa salam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakum Allah khayran for watching. Please subscribe, share, and you can visit muhammadtim.com.